Welcome to the Happy Lawyer Project. I'm your host, Akoma Moronu, and I created the show to help lawyers find happiness in life with a law degree. Together with my guests, we provide the knowledge, skills, insight, and inspiration you need to find your happy. Hey there, lawyers. How is everybody? Can you believe that summer is almost over? Oh my gosh. So it's been a really big week over here. We are about one week until go day, and there is still so much to freaking do. Ah, for those of you who are new in these parts, I am actually in the process of planning and preparing for a one year sabbatical and moving my entire family of four down to Costa Rica for the year. So if you want to learn more about that, you can by following me on Instagram at the happy lawyer project. And we will also as a family be documenting our journey on Instagram over at wild and together. So as for this podcast, just a reminder that I'm going to be taking a year end break and that'll start in a couple of weeks and I will be returning with all new episodes with all new content for you guys in the new year. But in order to really enjoy the sabbatical and make the most of this time, it was really important for me to take some time away from the show and spend some time with my kids and my husband and really getting into life in Costa Rica. So just wanted to remind you guys of that. As for this week's episode, I had the amazing opportunity to chat with Marco Brown. He is the managing partner of his firm, Brown Law, and has been honored as a top 100 divorce blog writer. He was the 2016 Best Divorce Lawyer in Salt Lake City. He won an award as the 2015 Family Law Lawyer of the Year and so many more awards. Despite all of this notoriety, what I learned about Marco is that he wasn't finding the health happiness or fulfillment that he wanted from his life or his career. And on today's show, we chat about how he used the idea of apex habits to focus on developing habits that changed his life. He explains how he identified his own apex habits and how they impacted his health, wealth, and happiness. I hope you guys enjoy. Welcome back to the Happy Lawyer Project, lawyers. I am very excited to have on today's guest. It's taken me a while to get him on, but I think it was well worth the wait. Marco Brown, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you very much for having me on. Thank you so much for coming. So I would love if you could just get started by sharing a brief description of who you are and what it is that you do. Sure. So I'm an attorney. I'm a divorce attorney in Salt Lake City, Utah. I went to the University of Nebraska for law school and then clerked first, which I really enjoyed. And then I spent a couple of years after that in an insurance defense firm, which I did not enjoy at all, and came to Utah so my wife could get her doctorate at the University of Utah, opened my own firm, and went through everything that somebody who opens their own firm went through. And finally, kind of decided to just go with divorce. And that's what I've done for years now. So that's pretty interesting. It feels like you've done a lot of different things. Let's start from the beginning. I mean, why did you initially decide to go into the law? When I was a kid, my grandma was a professor at New Mexico State University. She got a doctorate when women didn't really get doctorates. And then she went and was a professor. She was an education professor, but really she was a psychologist. Beautiful woman. I think still the smartest woman I've ever met in my entire life, read incredibly fast, cognitively it was just amazing up until, you know, right before she died, she kept her head about her. So I always knew that I would kind of follow in those footsteps. My dad was an educated guy, had a couple of master's degrees. My mom was a really bright woman. So I knew when I was about eight years old that I would get some sort of professional degree, some sort of doctorate. And... I always figured when I was a kid, it would be, you know, I'd become a lawyer because that just seemed to fit my personality. Then I went through you know, what teenagers go through and young adults go through trying to figure out what you're going to do. So I was a psych major and I thought I'd go into clinical psychology. And then I just realized one day that I wasn't cut out for that so much. I was cut out to be a lawyer. And so I just went with it. You started kind of in one end of the law and ended up in a totally different practice area. How did you make those decisions throughout your years? I wish the answer were something kind of sexy or deep, but (laughs) it really really wasn't. So I clerked after law school because I really wanted to clerk. Uh, Clerking is like graduate school for lawyers. 
I love that job. Still probably my favorite job in the law. I loved my judges. I worked four tens. I went in the first day and asked all my judges if I could work four tens and they all thought that was great. So I had three day weekends. It was fantastic, right? But you only do it for a year. I learned so much during that that year about writing and thinking like a judge, you know, how arguing when the good and the bad and the ugly of being an attorney. It was just fantastic. And then I took a job with an insurance defense firm because at that point it was 2008 mm. and the downturn was kind of starting. So I took the job that I could get and it just didn't work out. It was horrible. It was boring. I actually worked for a good firm in New Mexico, but working for a good insurance defense firm is like being in the better part of hell. It just doesn't. <laughs> It just doesn't work. For people out there who are not familiar, kind of what's the day-to-day work of an insurance defense attorney? Lots and lots of discovery. Okay. Yeah. It was just sitting in front of my computer every day doing discovery and then some more discovery. And I'd write something every once in a while and I would go to court about every six months. And I just realized within myself that going to court in litigation was what I wanted to do probably more than anything else. And where I was, was never going to get me there. So then it was a fairly easy decision to kind of make the move to Utah and follow your wife. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty simple. So I had actually quit. I I went to my wife just before Thanksgiving one year and I said, I can't do this anymore. I hadn't smiled for about three months. So she was totally fine with me (laughs) me quitting because she wanted her husband back. So I told her I was going to quit. And then we had kind of talked about her going and getting her doctorate, but she really ramped it up and then decided that she wanted to. And I said, okay, well, you know, we're free from this, so we can go up to Salt Lake anytime. And we made that transition. Kind of a hard transition because you have to take a different bar exam. I had to take the bar exam over again, which is not a pleasant experience. And so there's about a six-month window when I couldn't do any work and I stayed home with our son and you know got ready to come up here to Utah and get things going. And then when I came here to Utah, it's 2010 and we're just in the throes. Like everything is garbage. The economy is just terrible at that point. Everybody's reeling, you know, big firms in New York and Chicago are going out of business. So nobody was hiring. And I thought, okay, well, if I'm ever going to start a law firm, I'm going to start it now. So I did. I'm not that bright a guy though, because that was not a good decision in 2010. Right. That was a very bad decision when I look at it, but I just kind of made it work. Well, why do you say it was a bad decision? I mean, it seemed like the best decision considering the circumstances. What else could you have done? What would you have done differently, I guess? Sure. I I wouldn't have done anything differently now that I look back at it. I say it's a bad decision because Mm -hmm. when you look at it objectively, it was the least safe decision, which isn't always a bad decision. For a lot of people, though, that don't have the ability to go out on their own because there's a certain type that can deal with that kind of stress, then it is a bad decision. But for me, it was, a, it was a great one and I wouldn't change anything at all. So let's talk about that. You mentioned briefly about going through all the things a lawyer goes through when they yeah. decide to go out on their own. What are those things? What are the first kind of couple of years as a solo practitioner like? They're tough because one, you're usually unfocused. And I give a CLE to attorneys and uh, what I talk to them about is getting paid and the rules for getting paid. And one of my rules is you have to focus as much as humanly possible. If you can just do one thing as an attorney, do one thing. When I started though, I made all the mistakes. I, I was unfocused. I would take whatever case came in the door because I felt I needed money. So I was chasing money. And I was doing a lot of work that I couldn't bill for because I was doing a lot of different things that I wasn't good at. So I had to write off time and I had all these administrative tasks that I needed to do. So billing, you know, kind of got put by the wayside. So I wasn't making the type of money that I really should have made or billing and collecting the way I, I should have. It was just a mess. It was a mess for a couple of years. And the reason I go out and I talk to lawyers is to try to help them over that mess so they don't spend two or three years like I did, just kind of running around aimlessly. How did you turn that around for you? I mean, how did you eventually land on divorce law as something you wanted to be your focus? Yeah, that one, I was doing a lot of criminal defense because I figured that's what I wanted to do. And then I started doing it. I figured I wasn't any good at it. So when you're doing things you're not good at, 
and it's stressful, that's not a recipe for success. So I had a, a lady I knew when I was younger, about 20, and I hadn't talked to her for a while. She calls me up because she knows I'm an attorney and she says, hey, my husband cheated on me and I need to get a divorce. And I said, sure, I can do that for you. I had absolutely no idea how to do a divorce. So I stayed up, I think until three o'clock in the morning the night before we met for our initial consultation and just read up on divorce, try to figure out how to do it. Then we talked the next day, I took her case and did well. You know, we got her a good result. We took care of her family and her kids, did well by them. And I kind of thought, wow, I seem to be okay at this. And then that was just kind of what came in the door more. And I started doing more and more of it. And I realized at that point that I was actually really pretty good at it. So I started letting all of the other things go by the wayside after a while. So like I said, I wish it were a sexier story, but it's really what the market gave me. And then what I figured out I was good at, and I decided to go with it. From a practical perspective, what does that transition look like? How do you start letting go of clients who are no longer the right clients? And how long does it take really to make that transition? So I think you have to make a decision to get rid of the clients. And that comes about by figuring out what you want to do. Like, who is your ideal client? And I'm only going to take those types of clients from now on. That's the easiest way to start. So you have all of these different types of clients. Then you decide, this is my ideal client, and I'm only going to take those from now on, right? That's the first transition. I think that's the easiest way to start. it. And then over time, necessarily, the non-ideal clients are going to start to drop off because you get done with their cases and then you're left with your ideal client. So you can do it that way. And that's the way I did it. The more drastic way to do it is just to say, all right, I'm doing this one thing and that's it. And this is the type of client I want. And all of these other people that don't fit that mold, I'm going to give them to other attorneys, right? I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to say, look, this is just not what I'm doing. You're going to be better served by other people. You can certainly do it that way. I think that's more kind of the nuclear option. And that's not the one I went with. I went with the more gradual approach. And how long did that gradual approach take from kind of the moment you decided until you were officially just a divorce attorney? Was that a matter of months? Would it take a year? It probably took between a year and a year and a half. Okay. Because you always have those straggler cases that just kind of hang on. Probably within six months, I'd say 80% of them were gone though. And then you have the 20% that just stick around for a while. By the time I got done with all of those, it was probably a year and a half. Yeah, no, I really like to talk about timing because I think sometimes people think things are going to happen much more quickly than they are and they think they're doing something wrong because it's not happening in a matter of days or weeks. (laughs) But, you know, careers happen over the span of years and businesses are built over the span of years. So I, I just really like to dig into the detail. Yeah, we have to be nice to ourselves. And that means that you know, we're not going to do things perfectly. It's going to take time to do it. If you want to lose weight, if you want to remake your body, if you want to get better sleep, if you want to you know, change your life at your job, it's just going to take time and you're going to mess up. And you know, it's okay. Just keep doing what you're doing. Keep to your vision and you'll be okay. So right now in your story, it sounds like everything's on the up and up. Everything's going really, really well. You found your niche. You found your stride. And my understanding is at some point you even were awarded Divorce Attorney of the Year by the Utah, why can't I say the word Utah? Utah Bar Association. But turns out things are not all as good as it looks. Or kind of, can you talk me through kind of the two sides of your career at that point? So I started my firm in 2010. By 2012... I was mostly doing divorce. By 13, it was all divorce. In 2015, I had done well enough within that section of of law to win Utah Divorce Attorney of the Year, which is great. Yeah, it was amazing. I was truly amazed by that. And I think that was the first time I realized that I had kind of undersold myself and my potential was far greater than I had anticipated it to be. The problem was, that I was still doing a whole bunch of the bad things that I tell lawyers not to do. So I get this award and I was just giddy about it. And that lasted for about two days because I'm that type of guy that moves on to the next, you know, the next thing to climb that next mountain. And I realized that I won this award, but all of the other problems still remained. It didn't actually change anything. It just made me feel good for a minute. And at that point, 
in 2015 is really when I looked at my life, my family's life and my law firm and decided that things just had to change because that award was fantastic. But at the same time, I had let myself get fat. When I was a kid, I was fat and then I lost a whole bunch of weight, like 80 pounds, but I let myself you know, gain weight back. My health was not great. My sleep wasn't great. I didn't really exercise that well. There were lots and lots of tough things going on and I decided that I needed to fix that. And that's when I went looking for what I call the apex habit, which is a habit that stands at the top of something. And from that, you get this kind of cascading effect to ameliorate a whole bunch of different problems. But you solved those different problems by doing one thing, by engaging in that apex habit. So in 15 is when I really started looking at that, thinking, all right, how am I going to do this? How am I going to change all of these things that I'm not particularly fond of? What is the one or two big things that I can do that's going to create this cascade effect? Where did you come up with this concept? Is it something you read about, heard about, came to you through divine you know, <laughs> intervention? What, where did this come from? No divine intervention on that one. It came from a book called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. Yep. I, I read it. I do not remember much of anything about that book besides the concept of the apex habit because Duhigg talks about habits and how to break them and how to, how to make them. I don't remember any of that stuff. I remember the apex habit though. And that, at that point in my life, seemed like a big deal. And so I decided to go with it. And it's a big deal. And how do you discover your apex habit? Or are there certain habits that just are apex habits? How do you go about that? I think they're always going to be different for different people. I mean, I know my apex habits, we can talk about them. But I think really what people need to do is look within themselves and say, all right, what are my real weaknesses? And what can I do in that arena to fix that? right? So if your weakness is you're stressed out at work because you do too much work and you don't bill and you don't get paid or you know, something like that, then the apex habit is getting paid. And that's what I talk about a lot. Sleep is another apex habit. Sleep out of anything, anything you do as yep. a human being is that thing that will help you with your physical nature, with your spiritual nature, with your emotional nature, and with, and with your family, right? So getting eight hours of sleep is for me a serious apex habit, right? Yeah. But you got to look at it and you have to say, okay, where am I super weak? What thing can I do that will create that cascading effect in the area where I'm really weak? So the sleep one makes intuitive sense to me because um, that's mm-hmm. definitely one that I think for me makes a huge, like I always get eight and a half hours of sleep because I know that everything else goes better. Like nothing is made worse by me getting enough sleep. I love this. So you've said getting paid, which also makes intuitive sense. If you have money and you're getting paid for what you're worth, everything else becomes a little bit easier. Getting sleep. Do you have any others? One of mine was to get up at 5 a.m. and work out. Okay. I'm off the boat. Um, <laughs> that's a no-go. Don't worry. My wife wakes up somewhere around 7.30 or 8. So we do not live like corresponding lives in that way. So talk to me about this because this is, I feel like about half my guests vouch by this. And you know, there's the other half that just can't get up before sunrise. Why did you feel like this was going to make that kind of change into your life and did it work? Yeah, it worked. The reason I did it is partially because of my sleep schedule. I've always been an early morning person. And there's this idea that people that aren't early morning people are lazy. But most of the time, what it is, is our internal clocks are simply different. Like some people, most people, about 80% are kind of early morning people. And then about 20% are very, very late night people. It might be above 20%. Anyway, they can't really do the 5 a.m. thing because it absolutely messes up their internal clock and, you know, they shouldn't be doing it. They should be doing things later at night when when their clock tells them to do those things and then waking up later in the day. But I've always been the kind of early person anyway. And I have to do all of the tough things in my day kind of right up front. Otherwise, I just don't get them done because my energy is gone by three o'clock in the afternoon. I'm pretty worthless after that. I can do social things after that, but when it comes to thinking really hard or writing or doing those sorts of things, I'm just not very good at it. So I have to front load my day. And I figured you know, getting up at 5 a.m. would allow me to front load a whole bunch of things before my family even got up and before I had to go to work. So when you're working with Apex Habits, is part of the idea that you should limit the number of things you're working 
on developing habits around? And if so, how many apex habits can you really be working on at one time? I think you absolutely do have to do that. There's this idea, you know, minimalism is all the rage, however you want to call it. But I think there's some traction to that thought or that line of thinking that you can never be efficient enough in your time to do all of the crap that we have to do. So you just have to let stuff go. And when it comes to apex habits, that's a huge thing. Because if you're trying to get 10 apex habits, it's not going to happen. I would think probably three, maybe four are about all you're going to get in the apex habits. And then you just hope that the cascading effect takes hold. I love that. I like anything that asks people or requires that people really focus on the few things that have a bigger impact. So after working in all this stuff, it's 2015. Talk to me about how your life has changed, kind of what the evolution was for you once you started focusing on improving your life. Sure. So I think the first couple things that I really determined when I looked at the Apex Habits was that I was going to get paid 100% for the work I did. Because I went through my business and I thought, all right, you know, where are the real problems here? And I identified all the things that I've been kind of talking about, all these mistakes that I was making. So, you know, not focusing enough, not getting the right types of clients, doing work, not sending out bills, not getting paid, which meant I work too much. I had less time with my family. I was stressed. I was stressing other people out. So I determined to get paid 100% for the work I did. In my job, in my business, that was the apex habit. Outside of that, there was the getting up at five, which I believe really helped in the health department. And, you know, I changed the way I ate as well. But getting up at five was really what changed things in that department. And the other one was getting my money in order. So we had debt, take out debt when you go to law school, right? Unless you're really bright. And then I paid also for my wife's master's degree and her doctor degree. So about $170,000 in debt. That was very, very stressful on me every single day. I felt like Sisyphus rolling a rock up a hill in purgatory. You know, that he gets to the top and then the rock rolls back down and he goes back down and he does it for all eternity. That's what I felt like. So I had to change that. I had to get that debt gone as fast as humanly possible. Those were probably the biggest changes that I made in 15. Oh, I love that. I'm all about getting paid and getting your money right. I mean, I, huge fans. We had way more debt than you. (laughs) Um, And we went to town on that as well because it felt like it was going to be this huge weight on my shoulder and really create a lot of feelings of scarcity and like fear. I'm so afraid every day. Correct. (laughs) And a lot of that fear comes from feeling like we're not going to be able to make money. Because if you were confident that you could make enough money to make those payments forever, there wouldn't be the fear. True. But part of my fear was always, what if I have kids and I want to be able to stay home with them? What if something were to happen to my parents and I want to take care of them? You know, like, yes, I'm a hardworking person. Yes, my intention is to like have a normal length career, but things happen. And if those things were to happen, I want to be able to make choices. Yeah, exactly. I'm a believer and there's a line, I I wish I had this on my memory. I believe it's in um, Psalms that a righteous man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And that has always stuck with me. And I realized in 2015, I had $170,000 in debt, other debt on, you know, the house and these things. I was never going to leave anybody anything except a pile of debt. And that was not an acceptable way to live, I came to determine. So... I mean, we have these conversations all the time. And I think, especially as females, we have these conversations in closed circles. But having you here, I'd be interested in your thoughts about kind of how these ideas of trying to provide for your family and, you know, have a semblance of balance and be there for your wife. I mean, you've touched on all these things. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about how that experience is similar for men and different for men. I've thought about this for a while and I'm just not entirely sure. And I think part of it probably is the fact that I got married when I was 24 to a girl, you know, Demery is my wife's name. She was 24. We kind of grew up together. We didn't have kids for a while. We weren't able to have kids. So we adopted our first son when we were 30. And then we just had another kid about 10 months ago. 
right. Oh, so, congratulations. Oh, thanks. He's my old age child is what, I, is what I say. So that's the place I'm coming from. So I have a very intact system to be able to deal with this. I planned it that way, but it also means that my wife watches the kids most of the time. She teaches at a local university, but it's, you know, 10, 15 hours a week. So she's able to watch the kids most of the time. I'm able to do this most of the time. And I think one of the big differences in the law for men and women is that men just tend to feel less guilt about being away from kids. That's been my experience. I have a lot of very good female attorney friends, and they always feel kind of guilty about that. And my guy friends just feel less guilty about that. And I think that's facilitated by the fact that almost all my guy friends are married and their wives are able to stay home with the kids. But that's probably a biological difference that well, makes it a little bit easier for us to kind of put up with what we have to put up with. It's interesting that you say that because I think a lot of my success came from not feeling much guilt about being away from my kids, but that was also because my husband stayed home with them. Yeah. And that was the plan going into it. Like we always knew I had more earning potential than him and that we were fine with him being the primary caregiver, despite the fact the kid's school still calls me before him. I still don't get it. Like... <laughs> I'm like, I'm an attorney. I have a full-time job. I'm like, you're calling me at my office right now. <laughs> Call oh, my husband. It's hard to break. At home. He's the one who drops them off and picks them up every day. <laughs> like, why are you calling me? So I, I wonder, like, I think that there's a lot that you're saying that's right on about there being a biological component, but there's also this social component of how comfortable we feel with the arrangement we have in our home for our children. If you're a woman who thought you would get to spend more time with your kids or you have that image of motherhood in your mind, it would obviously lead to higher levels of guilt. Yeah, it's a dashed expectation, right? And that causes us psychological stress. If that works, then fantastic. Go with it. You know, this is the way my wife and I had set up our family. This is exactly she wanted to she wanted to set it up. And it just happens to go along with what's my biological imperative and kind of what's hers, but that, you know, we all exist on a spectrum on these things. So there's lots of lawyers out there who are probably in a similar place that you were at in 2015, where they're just going from milestone to milestone, but not really finding much fulfillment. What is your best advice for them to kind of today, if they were trying to pick their first apex habit to focus on, how should they get started? I think that's deep. The answer is deep in the sense that you need to sit down with yourself and determine what makes you not happy. That's kind of a glib way to say it. What fulfills you, right? Because happiness and fulfillment are two entirely different things. Happiness is kind of the five-year-old way of looking at life. And then fulfillment is an adult way of looking at life. So you have to sit down with yourself and you have to really delve into what fulfills you and then determine, okay, this is what I want to do. This is the vision I have, right, for my fulfillment. And what do I lack in that that I need to work on? And then in those areas where you really are lacking, that's when you go and you find, okay, what's the one thing in this area that I can do that's going to create this cascading positive effect? That's the apex of it. So you really have to sit down with yourself and ask yourself some pretty tough questions, I think, that we almost never ask ourselves because attorneys not terribly introspective a lot of times. And we just don't have a huge amount of time to be super introspective. I mean, this is the kind of stuff you do when you just sit down for, you know, days and think through this. And and that was very, very difficult for me to do because I'm always kind of going, I'm trying to accomplish things. You're trying to be what we think an attorney should be, which is go, 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 bill, bill, bill all the time. But you really have to step back and just take some time with yourself and figure it out. Yeah. No, I think that that's great advice. The only thing I will push back on is I, <laughs> I have to say that I do think that there's something there in the five-year-old happy that is sometimes worth pursuing. And I think sometimes mm-hmm. people dismiss the things that made them happy as kids because they think those things aren't meaningful. But to your point, you can dig deeper into those things to find the seed of what about it was fulfilling and what the adult version of that is, right? I loved drawing when I was little. And now I, for fun, write children's books. And they're children's books that have meaning and they get to 
they get to promote values that I don't see in the children's books I read to my children. And so there's a lot of fulfillment I get out of that project. But it all came from kind of me looking back at like, what were the things that I could spend hours and hours and hours doing as a child that I just never even give time to now because I think they're not, you know, for grownups. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I think you're totally right. And if I gave short shrift to happiness, I apologize. <laughs> oh, no. Um, I just, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't make the point on the... <laughs> yeah. I just think that fulfillment, the way I think about it, to live for fulfillment is that going through the really, really difficult things that we all have to go through to get to the place we want to be. And those things that we have to go through to get to ultimately where we want to be are oftentimes not really happy things. Now, we go through a lot of happiness when we do it, and we're ultimately happy, but we have to go through a lot of stuff to get there. And that's kind of what I, what I meant with, by it. But you're right. I've actually started going back to the things from my childhood that I enjoyed and doing those more and more as I get older because I realize, hey, I dug this stuff when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I don't know why I stopped doing it. So, you know, I've started doing it again. Like I love to shoot, uh, shoot trap, you know, I shoot shotguns. I grew up in Alaska and we did that all the time. I hunted with my dad all the time. So I've started doing that again and it brings me an immense amount of pleasure. And I just think to myself, my heavens, why haven't I done this for 25 years? Yep. I love that. All right, so I am going to wrap up this segment of the show and we are going to move on to what I am call the happiness hot seat. And this is just a round of five quick fire questions that I like to ask every guest that comes on the show. So are you ready? Sure. Number one, how do you manage overwhelm? I prioritize sleep because there's this great quote by Dave Ramsey. It's uh, fatigue makes cowards of us all. So if you're not getting the requisite amount of sleep, you are going to be overwhelmed every day and there's nothing you're going to be able to do about it. So that's the first thing. The second thing is diet, eating right, and keeping yourself in shape. I think that's a huge thing. And third is team. So I have a team around me. If I didn't have the team, I get overwhelmed very, very quickly. I love that because it's so simple and it's attainable for everybody. And I think it's sometimes counterintuitive because we think that there's some magic spell to tackling overwhelm and you do it by like doing more. But what you're saying is you actually need to rest more, just nourish your body and ask for help, you know? Yeah, do less. I mean, honestly, just, just do less. If any given person were to cut one third of the stuff they had to do on a weekly basis, they would be happier. I couldn't agree more. So number two, what boundary have you set that has helped you prioritize your own happiness? It's an interesting question. I'm going to answer it like this. The the first thing is I don't have a phone in my office. And that is a boundary that has created a a huge amount of happiness. (laughs) And And the story behind this is I don't work the day-to-day on cases anymore. I have attorneys who do that. I do management. I do systems management. I do training, I do the marketing, the rainmaking. I do all of those sorts of things in the law office now. And that's taken a very long time and it took a lot of vision to get there. But when we switched over our phones, I think it's two or three years now, my office manager came to me and said, all right, which line do you want? And I just looked at her and I shook my head. And she said, are you serious? And I said, yeah, I don't have a phone in my office anymore. If I want to talk to somebody, I will call them on my cell phone. and that." is how I determine whether or not I really want to talk to somebody. And that's been fantastic. So I think that not everybody can do that. You have to really get to yourself to the point where you can. But you can get to the point where you're a lawyer and you don't have a phone in your office. Yeah, it's great. (laughs) It's fantastic. The second thing is I take vacations. That's how I deal with the stress of my my job a lot. And I take um, about two to four a year when I prioritize those. Uh, I love that. So number three, can you describe a specific mindset shift that changed your life? At some point, I had set goals for myself. And then without even thinking about it, I kind of blown past those goals. So what that did for me was to make me realize that my potential was seriously in excess of what I had imagined earlier in my life and that I needed to think way bigger about things than I had to accomplish and be fulfilled in, I was just thinking too small. 
Yes. Number four, besides Power of Habit, is there another book that has inspired you on your journey? I think I'm going to answer this by saying that this is the book I've learned the most from that has helped me the most in law. And it's actually a sales book. So we're all salespeople in the law. We might like to think that we're not or that we're above that. You know, we can lie to ourselves all we want, but we sell stuff to judges. We sell stuff to other attorneys and we have to sell clients to hire us. Otherwise, we don't help anybody. So we're salespeople. So the, the book is called The Closer Survival Guides by Grant Cardone, uh, the best sales book I've ever read. And I read a lot and I've tried to read a lot of sales books because I'm not very good at it. That's number one. And then number two, the most inspiring book that I've read that I reread on a yearly basis is Open by Andre Agassi. It's his autobiography. And it's just absolutely fantastic. I grew up watching Andre Agassi play tennis against Pete Sampras when I was a kid. And you were in one of two camps. You were in the Sampras camp, mm-hmm. or the Agassi camp, and maybe you were a Boris Becker fan, but no one liked them anyway. So I was always an Agassi guy. But I always thought he was kind of a punk kid from Vegas. And then I read his autobiography and I realized that he is this full-fledged human being, incredibly intelligent, great writer. I mean, it's like literature reading his autobiography. And it's just so inspiring what he had to overcome in order to do the things he did. I mean, he hates tennis. He literally hates tennis. But he stuck with it for, for so long. Just the things that he had to do to become the person he actually wanted to be. It's super inspiring. I read it all the time. Interesting. I'm going to have to add that to my list because I've heard that story and I've heard people say good things, but it kind of fell off my radar. Oh, it's fantastic. It's one of my top five books I've ever read. Oh, all right. I'm adding it to the list. So number five, what do you think separates happy lawyers from those lawyers who struggle to find happiness in life with a law degree? It's actually a really, really difficult question. I think primarily what distinguishes it is those people who actually wanted to be lawyers. Like God made some people to just be lawyers, Mm -hmm. right? That's their wheelhouse. And those are the ones that I find that tend to be the happiest. Like I was made to be a lawyer. I tried to go away from it for a while, but I had to come back to it. So I love being a lawyer now. I wasn't a huge fan the first five years because of the stress, but I love it. It's just kind of who I am. Those are the ones I tend to think are probably the happiest with it. And then the ones who are good at it as well, because it's easier to like something when you're good at it. So those who stop being a lawyer after five or seven years, when you're just kind of hitting your stride, I think they're kind of doing themselves a disservice unless they have a dream to do something else that's going to make them more fulfilled. Just stick with it and get to the point where you're actually really good at what you do and you'll just like it a lot more. Uh, I completely agree. I feel like in my fifth year was when I started to really love being a lawyer. People ask me all the time, is when you you decide you wanted to be a lawyer? And I say about three years into practicing law. Because up until then, I was like, what am I doing here? It was five for me. It was that 2015 sort of thing. So I guess that was seven, but it was really around the five-year mark when I had to determine whether or not I was going to keep being a lawyer and I decided to go with it. And then everything just kind of opened up after that. Yep. Awesome. So before I let you go, I have one last segment and I usually like to ask a listener for a question. And I got a question from Bobby that I thought you may be able to help me with. He says that... He feels like he should be able to make eighty to $100,000 a year helping small businesses be happy, love his work and his clients, and still have time to travel and surf and do the things he loves. But he feels lost and needs a plan. Do you have any advice? My advice is make your first priority to get paid. So we're taught as lawyers very early on by law professors And then when we become lawyers by our bar associations, that our number one job as an attorney is to give away our stuff for free or to do good or whatever they say. I don't even know what that stuff means. But your number one job as an attorney is to get paid. So go get clients, do very good work for them, and get paid 100% for the work you do. And I guarantee you, if you make that your number one job, then you will have way more than 100000 and you'll be able to take vacations whenever you want. 
Amen. I mean, I agree. And I think that people forget that you can't help anybody if you're not getting paid. Like you're not going to stay an attorney. You're not going to have be able to reach your clients. Like nobody benefits from you starving yourself in your practice. Yeah, exactly. And it's not just you. I mean, you starve yourself, but you're being totally selfish if you're not getting paid 100% because you're allowing your clients to steal from you, right? You've done the work and they owe you money. You're not requiring them to pay you. So they're stealing from you and you're allowing that to happen. That's not okay. That's unethical. And then you're stealing from your family because you're stealing time from them. You're stealing money from them. And I guarantee you, if you're getting paid 50 cents on the dollar, 60, 70 cents on the dollar, your legal assistant and the people at work with you don't really like you that much Mm -hmm. because you're stealing from them too. They're not getting paid what they should and they're working too much for what they're getting paid. Yep. And you touched on this before and I think it was well said. You just need to focus on one thing, get good at that thing, figure out who the clients are for that thing and then make money doing it. Exactly. Awesome. So now is the time that you can kind of share what you're up to and what's the best way for people to reach out, follow you, or, you know, just find out what you're doing. What, what do you mean by I'm up to? Are you speaking anywhere? Is there anything that you would like to share with my audience or anything you're working on or have going on in your world that may be of interest? I'm always trying to go out to speak. I went to my alma mater, University of Nebraska, last year and talked to them, talked to the students and the attorneys about getting paid. I've gone to lots of different bar associations to do this. So if anybody out there thinks that this would help them or their firms or their you know, members of their bar association, always happy to, to come talk to them. I preach this gospel because I think in the end, it solves a humongous amount of problems. If you don't have your money right and you don't have your business right, then getting your life right and your stress right is almost impossible. So I go and I talk about this as much as I can. And if people are interested in possibly having you come speak, what's the best way to reach out to you or learn more about kind of how to engage you? I think the best way would be send me an email. It's marco, M-A-R-C-O, at utdivorceattorney.com. You can call my office as well. It's 801-685-9999. I don't do social terribly well as an attorney. I do it okay personally, but that's mostly Facebook. And I always keep Facebook quarantined from my legal life. But I'm on LinkedIn a lot. I post there almost every day. I post uh, books that I read and I, I read a lot. This year, I'm on track to read about 125 books. So I post that all the time. Different things on LinkedIn, different things on my blog. But LinkedIn is probably one of the easier ways to find me. I love that. And I love that you can give your phone number out because you don't have a phone in your actual office. (laughs) I do not have a phone in my office. (laughs) Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciated having you on. That was great. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening. And if you got value out of this episode and you think there's someone else who might enjoy it, I'd love for you guys to share. And if you have any questions for me, please head over to the website at thehappylawyerproject.com and you can leave me a voicemail right on the website. When you get there, you'll see a little tab on the right hand of the screen and you can click on it and leave a voicemail there. I absolutely love hearing from you guys. Last but not least, if you enjoy this podcast and you like the content that I'm bringing to you guys and you haven't done so already, I would really encourage you guys to head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a rating and review. That's all for this week. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening.